these people who play the Japanese. This building uh, was built around 1907. It's on a National Register of Historic Places. This was a wireless station. Wireless is the name that they first gave to radio. Basically, you want to contact somebody who's not where you are, and you're not going to use wires. In other words, you're not using telegraph, or you're not using telephone. And this station was on the beach near Point Judith, Rhode Island. As a matter of fact, it was at one particular beach. Not Scarborough, what's the other one with the calm water? It's with a W now, I think. I'm not the only one I can't remember the name. Wheeler, 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 Wheeler. I'm going to write that down on a note card. I got credit more. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> so if, what that station did, basically, the man who owned this, he contracted with steamboats that went up and down our bay. They'd come out of New York, they'd come down here, then they'd go up to Maine, go down to Florida, and they'd take people just like you on trips. You're on vacation. And he approached him, he says, you know, what happens if you break down out there and you're far enough away that nobody can see any signals you put up with light? Who's going to take care of you? He says, I will put a radio station in your, in your ship, very primitive radio station. They're only doing it, they're just barely getting to do it. They're just barely learning how. I'll put it in your ship, I'll have one on the coast, and I've got them all on the east coast, and I've got them on the west coast, and I've got two of them in Alaska besides. And if you have a problem, contact me, and I will get the coast guide to you. At that time, he could transmit as far as 35 miles. Whoa. Yeah. That's nothing, right? By the time he closed down, about five or six years later, he could transmit 510 miles, on rare occasions, 1,500 miles. And it, this type of station was totally illegal by 1920, because of the kind of output that it had. By then, actually by around 1915, they were using something called vacuum tubes. How many people know what a vacuum tube is? Just, just <laughs> an idea. Okay. Most of you do, children won't, but they had vacuum tubes then. And vacuum tubes allowed them to transmit on very discreet frequencies. The transmitter we have upstairs, if you're a transmitter on that, you all know on the AM band you got 55 five over here and 17 over here, right? You got all different stations. Is 63, what's 63 in Rhode Island? WPRO, right. Would you expect to hear WPRO over here where it's 17? No. But if I use the transmitter here, you will hear it at every single space along, everywhere. Because the kind of transmitters they use made big spots. Where do you see big spots, naturally? Lightning. Lightning. Suppose you're listening to an AM radio. You're just listening, just listening, having a good time, and lightning goes off, and you hear crackling in your speaker. That crackling is radio energy made by lightning. Originally, people didn't know that lightning made radio energy. What energy did they know? They knew it made light, it made sound, and it made heat, because you could all take that in. But nobody here is able to receive radio energy with your eyes or your ears. We're not tuned to it. But a guy by the name of Edison took a magnet and just by chance put it near a light bulb. He noticed that the light bulb flickered. He says, something's going through the air. He called the air ether. And he didn't know what it was. He says, something's there. 
He published an article. He says, all you scientists, play with it. I got too many other things to do, which he did. He did everything in the world, all right? And they found out that lightning makes that stuff. And you can actually make a radio transmit using lightning. But you got to make your own lightning. So I have one right over here, which I can demonstrate. I have to ask, though, if you have a medical device like a pacemaker, you, you should not be in a room when I do this, all right? And if you are, if stroboscopic things bother you, if you have epilepsy like that, you might not want to look, okay? So over here, we have a transmitter, it's a small one. Electricity comes in here, 120 volts, we just plug it into electricity. It goes to a transformer. Transformer takes a voltage and pushes it up. So instead of 120 volts, we've got 5,000, 10,000 volts coming out of here. Then electricity goes to a capacitor, it's a black box up here. And the capacitor stores the electricity, it charges it, and then it lets it go. But it charges and lets it go once 120 times per second, so quick that you wouldn't notice. And when it charges it and lets it go, it lets it go to a couple places. It lets some of it go, you see at the very top there, these two little things pointing at each other? And they have a space between them. Now is electricity supposed to go through a wire or through air, basically? To go through a wire. wire. So if you got your wire and it connects to a light bulb and a battery, you push the button, a light bulb lights up and you say, big deal. Somebody cuts the wire, not going to work. So you say, well, electricity can't go through there. But if the electricity is a huge amount of electricity, it'll go through air. It'll jump that gap. It'll jump that gap. And that's what they call a, a spark gap transmitter. You make your own lightning. Does it go as far as real lightning? No, because it's not as big. So when this guy started the station, the station's upstairs, it went 35 miles or so. They made bigger antennas and bigger spots, and it went farther and farther. So if I make this work, and this, this is a special inductor or tuning coil or a helix, it helps make it so that it's on a particular frequency before it goes out to the antenna. It doesn't work very well. As I mentioned, I don't, did I mention that you'd hear the spot gap transmitter on all the frequencies? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm going to run this. We have a light bulb here to soak up so many energy. It may startle you when I do it. Actually, somebody else want to do it instead of me? <laughs> I would just recommend if you touch this, you just touch the plastic on the key. Don't touch the metal. Although you probably wouldn't guess spot because no one says that. Who wants to do it? Go for it. Good. Go for it. <laughs> was that a good one? Did you like that? Wow. It is. It is. It is. That's why I said it's going to stop. I really smell it. The big people jump too. <laughs> so I'm sending a signal out. CQ. Yeah. And that means anybody can hear me come back and talk to me. I want to talk to you on the radio. But this is a little one. So when this was at the beach down near uh, Wheeler, Wheeler Beach, this was right on the sand. And the family who maintained this place would live downstairs. And they saw this radio station, it was in a local house. It took about three years before they built this. They built this, it was part, most of the building was paid for by a Providence Journal, which some of them were familiar with Providence Journal. Yeah, Providence Journal, well, yes, where the PJ comes from. Or Point Judith, Point to be the yeah. one. Yeah. Providence Journal wanted to make some money, and they figured, well, there's a bunch of people out in Block Island, they don't know what's going on in the world, and we'll send them a newspaper. They said, well, why don't you just take, we'll send it to them by Morse code, by radio. Of course, she would say, why don't you just put it on the ferry? If you went down to Point Judith on 4th of July this year, there was a ferry going and coming, going and coming every 30 minutes. There was, and then that's just the regular ferries. Then you have the other ferry, the, what do you call it, the water, high speed one, that was going too. And then you can take airplane trips every 30 minutes also. Back then, you got the block on if you owned a boat. That's basically it, early 1900s, no ferries. So they said, well, we're going to send them a newspaper. If you look right behind you here, this is all the newspapers they sent. These are copies of all the newspapers that went. They would send a newspaper every day for one summer to Block Island, one word at a time, by Morse code. When it got over there, somebody's writing this down. And after they write it down, they typeset it, and they made a newspaper, and got a newspaper out to the people. Uh, the Providence Journal said, boy, this is, a, this is a tedious thing. And they got tired of it after one summer, and they quit. So the man who owned all this by the name of Mr. Massey, or he's actually the one they brought in at that point, and he says, you gotta do something else with this place. He was an engineer, a civil engineer from Providence, and he did radio as a hobby. So he made it into a business. All the radios you see in this room, he built them, he made them. And this is professional stuff. This is all made in Providence. 
This is a facsimile. He made this also. This was actually made by some of our volunteers, so we didn't have that. But all the equipment that was in this original building was sent to a home in Attleboro when they just when they took the building down uh, a long time ago, back in the 19, late 1920s, and became a private residence. We got all the equipment back. And so basically the way it worked, this is your transmission and a receiving station. You would send information to a ship. I got pictures of ship miners right there on the wall. He would approach the ship and talk to you, suppose you own the ship, you're the owner. He'd say, you know, what if you're out there in the middle of the ocean and you're on fire? And you're 15 miles out, nobody can even tell you're on fire. How do you get help? With radio, you can call me. You know, they, <laughs> mostly that's what they did. That and yeah. quacks. Yeah. They quacks. Semaphores. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Semaphores, correct. Yeah. But it doesn't work for long distances. He says, for radio, I can contact you for 35 miles. Now, that doesn't sound like much. That's as much as he could do. By the time this place was closed down, he could do 560 miles. On rare occasions, 1,500 miles. Now, we can do radio transmissions any distance we want, including to other planets and so on. It's, it's totally different. So he would put his own man on their boat, put all his equipment on their boat, and of course they had to pay for all that. When they, we'd have an operator standing, sitting over here waiting, there was always a telescope here. You look out the window, you'd see the waves in the ocean. And the operator waits for something to come in. Over here we have an announcer. Now, that's a bell, just like a regular doorbell. So what happens is this is connected to an antenna. And when a signal comes in, the bell rings. So they go, how does the bell ring because the signal comes in? In the back of that, they would have and over here, we can replace with a modern one. It has something called a coherer. It's just a little piece of glass tubing with iron filings in it and two wires on there. And they'd have a battery connected to it. And the battery runs the bell. But electricity won't go through the iron filings very well. Now, if you know what, electricity goes through something it has resistance. You've all done that in high school, right? So for the kids, it has resistance going through there. And those iron filings, resistance is probably 15 to 20 mega ohms. Not enough electricity will go through to make that little light light up or a bell ring. But if a radio signal comes into an antenna and it goes through that coherer, suddenly the resistance changes to less than its own. Electricity goes through, the bell rings. And here it runs. The thing's still stuck on the other side there, though. And it may go back and forth on the bell, but there's no information coming, just the bell ringing. So what happens is they have another knocker like this. It knocks that little that little um, tube, and all the iron filings fall apart. You can't mm -hmm. see it; it's microscopic. They fall apart, and immediately they go back together again at a speed faster than you can think. If the signal is still coming, and if it's a short signal, dit. That's a dit is a short signal. A da is a long signal. And by combining them, you get Morse code, and you get the information. All right. So how do we work this particular one? A radio like this has to have a, a huge transformer with electricity. 120 volts goes into this thing. Many thousands of volts and many, many amps come out. This is very powerful. So we got the wire here. Over here you have a coil, and here you have a capacitor. Downstairs the capacitor, we have one on display about that big. This capacitor is pretty big. It's got, it's got metal sheets and glass sheets. Metal conducts, glass is not. When you put conductors and non-conductors together, you have capacitors. What capacitors do is they store energy. You shoot energy into them, and they store up that energy, and then they release it. And when they release it, a large amount at one time, you can do certain things like make a spark. And if you look in here, you can see that rod going down the middle. There's a little space there. Now, normally, electricity won't go through the air. But if you have a huge amount of electricity, it will go through the air. And you'll get the spark. Just like with lightning. The lightning puts off radio waves, so they're making their own radio waves right there. Send it to an antenna through that hole in the wall up there. There is no antenna attached to that, though. And you also have a meter to, do, to uh, tell you how much energy you're putting out. We put a light bulb here instead of an antenna. The light bulb will soak up the radio energy, some of it anyways. It still gets out. It's illegal for us to transmit with this. It was made illegal right around 1920 or so. The reason being because if you're transmitting on this thing, you're supposed to transmit on about 250 to 300 kilohertz. Now, if you're looking at your AM radio, you got 55 five over here, up oh, 55 five over, usually 55 five over moving. here and 17 over here, right on your AM radio. All right. You expect to hear what? It's 63. Yeah. WPRO. You don't expect to see or hear what's at 55. 
If I transmit on this thing, it's supposed to be at 250 kilohertz, which is below any of those. 5.5 five is 5,500 kilohertz. But if I do transmit on this, it'll be heard on every one of those radio stations all the way across. That's not a good thing, okay? Imagine it's 1912 and you're in the Titanic and it's going down and you're transmitting an SOS and there's 12 other chips, 12 other chips with ships within 200 miles of you and they're all transmitting various things. Whoever has the biggest antenna and the biggest radio will put out the biggest wave and they'll they'll blot you up. Nobody will hear you say help, help, help. And that's part of what happened. And when that guy got through from the Titanic, everybody eventually started shutting up here. He told them, I've got an emergency here. And it took a while to do that. So you go to the next building and look, you're gonna see a ship's transmitting station there. And there'll be a clock on it. The clock came out after 1912. There's two red wedges on the clock. And each of those red wedges covers four minutes. That's a ship's clock. During those four minutes, you cannot transmit at all. That's reserved only for distress signals, and you have to listen. Again, they still had spot gap, and they would cover everybody's signal. So this one would cover everything. I already talked, and nobody here has space makers and so on, right? So I can transmit on this one. It's probably not as big as the last one, but sound it. You can notice the meter going up there also. So it's pretty heavy duty stuff. When they send the message, the man, man would be over here, he heard the annunciator go, he came over here, he answered them, he wrote down the message on a piece of paper, and they probably, it's probably not distress signal, it's probably, this is John Jones, he wants you to call his brother in Ohio and tell him he's having a good time. So our man would come over here and he'd go to a telegraph station, totally different. This is telegraph. It uses Morse code, but it's different. This is connected to wires that go out on telephone poles that go throughout the entire country. And the propeller will go around and that will produce electricity. So the spot cars are very so that line of play basically amplifying the signal, like, like, like this, like you know, exactly. That's, that's the magnet, right? It's sending out, it's feeling like that, and then you trick it down to a point directed right at it, so you make it really strong. That's what I did. The Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 